Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory operations research based on my book, Linear Programming, Duality, and Game Theory. The subject of this lecture is what is operations research, and a little bit about its history and the kinds of problems that one does using operations research. I'm going to start with a problem to whet your appetite and show you the kinds of problems that one does using operations research. A league has 10 teams, this is a soccer league, and the season has nine rounds. Now, there's some basic requirements for scheduling this league. The first one is that each team plays each other team exactly once. There are nine rounds and 10 teams. So if you are a team, every round you're going to play one of the other teams. Games could be home games or away games. Each team must play at least four games at home. That's one of the requirements. Another requirement is that teams three and four share a stadium. And so they cannot pay, play at home in the same round. Teams 1 through 5 are considered northern teams, and teams 6 through 10 are southern teams. And here's some extra conditions. The conditions in the previous slide are things that you just have to satisfy. The extra conditions are things we really want, but under certain circumstances, we might be able to violate one or the other. A northern team is not to play two consecutive away games against southern teams and vice versa. That would be too much traveling. Teams 5, 6, and 10 are national favorites. And so the matchup between those is preferable to occur in the height of the season. And that's between the fourth and eighth rounds. Teams 1 and 9 are in tourist towns. We want each to play at least one home game against the national favorite the first three rounds when people are on vacation in these towns. Team two will not have its home field ready in time for the first round, so wants to play the first round away. And your job is to plan the schedule. Now, notice that these are a lot of requirements that you have to satisfy. You could sit there and try to manually figure out what the schedule would be, but you would want to know what kind of mathematics will provide the framework, will provide the language, provide the infrastructure to be able to solve this kinds of scheduling problem in a sort of a routine way. And the interesting thing about this problem is that it's not just made up, it's a problem that was a subject of a paper on the Chilean Soccer League. So actual uh, operation research folks were working on this problem. Actually, I, I've simplified the problem. Their problem had even more requirements. What if I can't satisfy each condition? What kinds of repercussions will that have? And so forth. This is a real life problem, the kind of problem that operations research people work on. I just gave you an example of an integer programming problem. It's integer programming because you can't just say you play half of your game here and another half somewhere else. You have to have a whole number of games allocated in certain ways. In this lecture, I'm going to tell you what operations research is and a little bit about its history. I will tell you what a linear program is and I will give you more examples. And I will tell you also what's covered in this set of lectures in the videos that will come after this. In a nutshell, OR, operations research, is applying common sense and mathematical thinking to problems of management and industry. It's a way for planning and adding efficiency. Operations research overlaps with a number of different areas, with optimization theory, combinatorial optimization, management science, industrial engineering, graph algorithms and network analysis, game theory, probability and statistics. In some cases, like management science, they overlap quite a bit. Operations research involves optimization, trying to find the best way to do something. It involves modeling and simulations. It involves taking real life situations, making assumptions, simplifying the, the problem and, and creating a model, then doing simulations to see how your model works and then going back and fixing your model and so forth. It involves probability and statistics in estimating the various parameters and also afterwards, after you have your model to try to check to see how well it's doing. Also, some of the models are stochastic models that involve probability right from the get-go. OR is an interdisciplinary subject. It has its own graduate programs, its own research journals, and its own professional societies. And in fact, it's an attractive option for people who like mathematical ways of thinking, but would like to do something that's directly applicable to what's happening in the world today. Operations research has many applications. Some of these are schedule and assignment problems, like the example that I showed you, routing, transportation, and network problems, critical path analysis, supply chain management, inventory management, financial engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence, graph algorithms, economics, game theory. It also has applications in pure mathematics, in combinatorics and graph theory. In fact, that's why I'm interested in it. I do combinatorics for a living, and I got interested in linear programming because you can use linear linear programming techniques to prove theorems in math. Where does this word operation research and the word linear programming come from? What do they mean? They come from the military, actually. 
Operations research is research in military operations. Linear programming is programming military operations. And programming does not refer to computer programming. Operations research and linear programming predate computers. While we do use computers quite a bit now, and we use various kinds of programming to do linear programming, linear programming is not about computer programming. Here's a problem. During World War II, the British Royal Air Force, RAF, was bombing German submarines. One of the things they had to do was they had to set the time fuse of the bombs to decide when would the bomb go off after they dropped it and how far would be the depth under the ocean surface that it should explode. And that was the problem that they wanted to solve. At what depth should they set those fuses so that the bombs would explode at the right place to maximize the chances of hitting the submarines? The Central Command's initial argument was that if the submarine sights the plane, it's not going to just sit there waiting for you. It's going to dive. And, and if it sights it two minutes before the attack and dives, it will be able to go about 100 feet below the surface. And so they set the fuse to de detonate 100 feet below the ocean surface. And they did that, but the results were not that good, meaning that they couldn't kill enough people. They brought together a group of scientists, and they nicknamed it Blackett's Circus. It involved all kinds of people. Six of them were mathematicians and physicists. I think three of them were biologists. There was a surveyor, and there was an army officer also, and gave them this problem. These guys thought about it, and they came up with the following argument. They said that if the submarine dives for two minutes, as the central command had suggested, then it will go down 100 feet. But we don't know which direction it will go. After it dives, it could go this way, that way. It could go in any one of the directions. And the plane wouldn't really know which way it went. It won't be able to aim correctly. And so even though the bomb will explode at the right depth, it will be at the wrong place. On the other hand, if the submarine does not dive immediately, it doesn't realize that a plane is coming to bomb it, then the plane can take a good aim. But then the bomb is set to explode at the wrong de depth. It will be way below at the ocean surface to, to do damage. Their conclusion was that they should have the bomb explode at the water surface because the only realistic chance of hitting the submarine is if it's still at the surface and didn't realize that the plane is coming. They actually did this, and the results apparently improved twofold, meaning that they were able to destroy twice as many submarines as before. This is an example of what we would call game theory, where your actions depend on the opponent's actions, and you have to think through what the possibilities are. Applying mathematical ideas to war operations was so successful that people started trying to use this in other venues as well. And so operations research began in earnest after World War II. A vast number of problems were attacked under this rubric, and one of the places this was done was the Rand Corporation headquartered in Southern California, close to where I'm taping this video. And from the mid-40s to mid-50s of the previous century, a general framework for posing problems that could be solved was created, and some types of the problems were successfully solved. Why is OR so successful? Because many very practical problems can be formulated as linear optimization problems. The linear optimization problems are commonly called linear programming problems. And linear optimization problems can be solved efficiently. The simplex method, one of the things that we will discuss in this course in detail, solves linear optimization problems well. In the West, George Danzig was a crucial figure working for U.S. Defense Department. He devised the simplex method. He came up with it to solve a problem for the Air Force. George Danzig was at the U.S. Defense Department, then later went to Rand after that to Berkeley, and finally spent most of his career at Stanford. And the problem that he was trying to solve was given dietary needs of the servicemen, the people in the Air Force, what mixture of foods will provide it at the lowest cost? You want to feed the servicemen nutritious food, but you don't want to pay too much for it. And he came up with the simplex method. There's a second strand of the history coming from the Soviet Union. We're talking the Cold War era where different things were developed in the West and in the Soviet Union. Starting in the 30s, so before the war, Soviet mathematicians developed linear programming tools for planning a centralized economy. A key figure is Leonid Petrovich, the Soviet mathematician, and he came up with linear programming in 1939, uh, a number of years before dancing, and he was trying to organize the work of the plywood industry. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1975 for his work on linear programming. In the 1960s, they tried to use it to organize supply chain problems in the Soviet Union. There was some success, but it wasn't universally adopted. And the reason was that it needed too much data and computing. Computing technology was not quite ready back then. And the quality and timeliness of data was not good. By the time they got all the data they wanted to solve the linear programming problem, the data was already outdated. 
a good idea, but at the wrong time. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Kontrovich. During the war, he's a very interesting character. During the war, Leningrad, which is today St. Petersburg, was under siege for 29 months by the German and Finnish forces. This was known as the Siege of Leningrad. Over 1 million citizens of Leningrad perished during this siege. The only access to the outside and food was through a path across the frozen Lake Ladogo. The lake freezes in the winter. Some of it freezes during the fall, but most of it freezes during the winter. And that's when you could send trucks across. And this road was called the road of life because it was the only way to get food into Leningrad. Kontrovich was responsible for safety in the road of life. The question that he had to answer was, what's the minimum safe distance between supply trucks? If you had the trucks going across on the frozen lake too close to each other, that would be too much weight and the ice would break and the trucks would be lost. On the other hand, if you put too much space between them, then you couldn't get that much trucks across and you couldn't get as much supply as you wanted. So you wanted to have them be close to each other, but not too close. Kontrovich modeled the ice thickness to approximate the answer. The story is told that he would go on the lake personally and walk between the cars on the ice to make sure that they didn't sink and that the data that he was using for the ice was accurate. Actually, many did sink, but not because of Kontrovich's models, but because of aerial bombings by the German Air Force. As I have been saying, OR has its roots in the military and war. It was used to be more efficient in killing people. And subsequently, since then, it has been used extensively both in the military and by corporate management, and also by nonprofits, city planners, environmental activists, and so forth. It has uses all over the place. Scholars in history, philosophy and science, technology, and society often delve into OR and its uses when they want to discuss the relationships between technology, pursuit of knowledge, ethics, and the benefits and perils for society. Linear programming uses linear algebra quite a bit. In linear algebra, solving a system of linear equations is very important, and it comes up all the time. If you have a set of vectors and you want to know if they're linearly independent, or if you want to know if they span this or that, whatever you want to do in linear algebra, at the end of the day, you're solving a system of linear equations, which is why doing row reduction is, is so important in linear algebra. In linear programming, instead of linear equations, we look at linear inequalities. Instead of having 3x plus 2y equals 5, we'll have 3x plus 2y less than or equal to 5. And because of that, often there will be lots of solutions to those systems of linear equalities, and then we can find the best one according to some criteria. Many things fall under this rubric, and many applications can be translated or approximated by this kind of a situation where you are trying to minimize or maximize a linear function, but subject to linear inequalities operations research, there's lots of things that fall under that rubric. We will, in the set of lectures, initially concentrate on linear programming and constraint optimization. So we want to optimize, maximize, or minimize some objective. And the objective is a multivariable fun function, and there are constraints on the variables. An example to illustrate that. In the next video, I will solve this problem. But for now, I'm just going to give you the problem. You want to make two types of mixed drinks. You're going to mix up pomegranate juice and sparkling water and sell them. You're going to make two types. For the first type, to make one gallon of it, you're going to use one third gallon of pomegranate and two thirds gallon of water. So you mix one third gallon of this and two thirds of that, and you get one gallon of your type one. For type two, you use more pomegranate, two thirds of gallon and less water. You have these two types and you sell them. For the first type, you make more money because you're using more water. You make $25 per gallon of profits. For the second one, you make $20 per gallon of profits. These numbers are all made up. And you have some constraints. You don't have unlimited supply of things. You have two gallons of pomegranate juice and you have three gallons of the sparkling water. You also have other constraints for some reason or another. You want to make at most two gallons of type two and type two not to exceed type one by more than one gallon. This is a proof of concept that you have a bunch of constraints and you have something that you want to maximize. You want to know how much of each type should you make to maximize profits. The mathematical formulation is like a lot of algebra problems. You first name things. When you name things, the good thing about that is that then you can treat them as if you know them. X1 is going to be the number of gallons of type 1 that you're going to make. X2 is going to be the number of gallons of type 2 you're going to make. These are called decision variables. What you want to do is maximize 25X1 plus 20X2. Each gallon of type 1 would give you $25 of profits, and each gallon of type 2 would give you $20. So the total amount of profits if you make X1 gallons of type 1 and X2 gallons of type 2 will be 25X1 plus 20X2.
And this is called the objective function. Z is the objective function, the thing that you want to, in this case, maximize. You have some constraints. The first constraint is how much pomegranate juice you have. If you make X1 gallons of type 1, each gallon uses one third of a gallon of pomegranate juice. So X1 over 3 is how much pomegranate juice you need for that. For the second type, you need 2x2 over 3. So altogether, that has to be less than or equal to 2 because that's how much pomegranate juice you have. For the sparkling water, the constraint is a little bit different because you need two-thirds of a gallon for each gallon of type 1 and one-third of a gallon for each of type 2, and you have three gallons of sparkling water. You also wanted, for some reason, that type 2 should not exceed more than two gallons, and you wanted the difference between them to be less than or equal to 1. These are called functionality constraints. We also have another constraint that we didn't say. We want both of these numbers to be greater or equal to zero. And those are called sign constraints. This is an example of a linear program. We have some decision variables. We want to maximize some objective function. We have functionality constraints and we have sign constraints. The questions that we have to answer is, well, first of all, how do you find an optimal solution? How do you prove that it's optimal? And we need to actually precisely formulate what kinds of problems are linear programming problems. I said problems like this, but how general can they be? In this set of lectures, we will do everything through matrices and linear algebra. And so we're going to translate to the language of linear algebra. We will spend a number of lectures telling you how to find the optimal solution, then looking under the hood and seeing how you prove that it's optimal and so on. What do these lectures cover? I'm going to be focusing on the underlying mathematics. This is not a management or engineering course, so I'm not so much interested in how you implement the various things that we are going to talk about or telling you things as a black box and saying, well, this is how you do things. We're interested in the why. We're going to be looking under the hood to see why things work. That's because knowing the theory is actually very helpful because when things change, if you know the math underlying, then you can adapt. But it's also because the theory is quite fun and amazing. So we want to look at the mathematics underlying linear programming, duality, and game theory. As far as topics are concerned, we will spend time on the simplex method, which is one of the top 10 most useful algorithms out there. And we will prove the fundamental theorem of linear programming. We will spend some time talking about duality in linear programming, whatever that is. Duality is a very interesting and a fundamental concept. We will use it for working on problems in integer programming, game theory, network flows, Markov chains, and a few applications in combinatorics. This is the end of this lecture. Like my video if you like it, and subscribe to my channel if you want to be subjected to math videos on your feed, and I will see you in the next lecture. Make sure you're hydrated at all times.